Great. So hello, everybody. Welcome to the Commission on Status of Women. How can I participate at CSW Training Forum for Asia Pacific Region event? It is a pleasure to have you here with us today. My name is Aurea Pongib Kanchanat Shari, and I will be your MC today. And before we start, I'd like to introduce the Asia Pacific NGO CSW 66 Organizing Committee team. Uh, so first off, our co-chairs, Carol Shaw, you can unmute and give us a hello. Yeah, uh, from Australia, and Bandana Renal from Nepal. Our co-chair, Helen Swales from New Zealand. Nice to be with you, thank you. And Suvetsha Rana from Nepal. Hello. And our regional committee members, Omaira Sharifi from Afghanistan. Hello. Nalima Basnet from Nepal. Hello, everyone. Sami Rajaswari Singh from Nepal. Hi, everyone. Uh, New Dilna Was Shek from Nepal. Hello. And myself, uh, Gib Kanshanashari from Thailand. Um, and our event today, um, I just wanna run through the itinerary for everybody today. So we have first, um, we're gonna have a welcome speech from our co-chair and we would like um, then to invite you to take a poll uh, with us to answer some questions that we'll find uh, useful for, for organizing future events and follow from that a presentation on CSW and then to the panel discussion event. Um, and then we'll, we'll come to a closing remark then. So please also note that the session will be recorded and will be posted on YouTube. The link for the YouTube will be posted on our website and Facebook account. So if you'd like to rewatch, uh, just keep an eye on the space and we'll be posting it in the next uh, week or so. So I would like now to introduce our vice, uh, co-vice chair, Helen Swells, who will be giving us a welcome remark. Helen has been a local government politician of 12 years and hold the position of deputy mayor of the city of Upper Hutt in New Zealand. She is a member of a specific women's watch in New Zealand and is the immediate past president of the New Zealand Founda uh, Federation of Business and Professional Women. Helen shares the women's empowerment principle, which is a UN woman and UN global compact initiative. <clears throat> Excuse me. She has been advocating for women and girls both on a national and international platform. Helen was also part of the delegation to Geneva to give the shadow country report to the CEDAW committee and has been a panelist in parallel and side events at CSW. She has also been a civil society delegate on the ne negotiating floor with the New Zealand government in 2019. And she has co-written two abstracts that the New Zealand government presented at the side events at CSW. Helen is a keen advocate for empowerment and inclusion of women in all aspects of life. And I will now hand over to Helen for the welcome remarks. Thank you. Oh, thank you very, very much, Gib, for that wonderful um, introduction. Um, I promise not to keep you long because the purpose of this webinar is actually to share views. So it's my pleasure to welcome you and open the webinar with this informal welcome to our registrants and to who have come to this forum to learn, share and engage with the topic on how to participate at CSW, the Commission on the Status of Women. This, our first event that Asia Pacific NGO CSW will be hosting leading up to CSW 66 in March 2022. The Commission of the Status of Women has a gender framework to eliminate by 2030 poverty, reduce inequality and protect the planet. Yet progress has fallen short, well short of what is required to achieve this target. In order to achieve the world that we want, it needs active part partnerships among international bodies, governments, local authorities, corporations, and civil society to come together to deliver on the promise of the Declaration of the Beijing Platform for Action. 
where 189 countries joined by 17,000 participants and 30,000 non-government activists attended the Women's Fourth World Four Conference hosted by China. The Beijing platform was a resolution adopted by the UN at the end of the Fourth World Conference on Women on September 15, 1995. This resolution adopted promise to promulgate the set of principles concerning the equality of men and women globally. So it is important for civil society and non-government agencies to participate in these important discussions to progress and achieve this agenda by 2030. So to understand the process to achieve the most out of the experience, this is just the beginning of the journey. It is just as important post the event that we hold those accountable to the agreed conclusions to move forward to achieving the world we need and the world that we want to meet the sustainable development goals by 2030. I look forward to your contributions, which are really important in this conversation. And I won't have anything more to say, but I would like to hand back to our MC, Gib. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, for that. Um very warm and inspiring um, welcome remarks. Um, uh, so now we would like to engage with the audience, you and the audience, and we would like um, to ask you to participate in answering eight questions with us. So I think uh, somebody will put the poll up. Um, and the purpose of the polls is for us as a committee to have a better understanding of the CSW participants. Uh, the results will be anonymous, and uh, we will show the overall statistics results at the end, but individual answers will be confidential. And um, so if you can see, there are eight questions. Um, and and from, from, from all of this, we will be organizing the most, uh, what we feel the most suitable coming trainings, events and sessions. So if you can click on your screen, the yes or no for the following questions, I'll just read them out as, as you go through them as well. So question one, have you attended CSW in person at the United Nations in New York? Question two, were you representing an NGO? Question three, do you, did you attend as a government delegate? Question four, do you run a parallel event? Have you run a parallel event at CSW? My apology. Question five, have you or your organization submitted a statement to CSW? Question six, do you have a focal point for NGO CSW in your country? Question seven, are you aware of the agreed conclusions drafting process? And the last question, question eight, do you use the agreed conclusion from CSW in your work? So if, if anybody's having any problem or they can't see the poll, I think you can um, write in the, in the chat or raise your hand and we can check that for you as well. So I'll just give everybody a minute to do that, that poll. So if everybody has finished, okay, thank you. So um, I'll just read out the result. Thank you very much for taking part in, in answering these questions for us. Um, so question one, have you attended CSW in person at the United Nation in New York? We have 67% yes and 33% no. Question two, were you representing an NGO? We have also 67% yes uh, and 33% no. Do you attend as a government delegate? 100% on the no. Have you run a parallel event at CSW? 67% yes, 
33% no. Have you and your organization submitted a statement to CSW? 67% yes, and 33% no. Do you have a focal point for CSW NGO in your country? 33% yes, 67% no, and zero for don't know. Are you aware of the agreed conclusion drafting process? We have 100% yes, that's great. Do you use the agreed conclusion from CSW in your work? Also 100% yes. So thank you very much for, for taking that. It'd be very useful for us to, to have that statistic. Okay. So now um, we'll move on to our next session, which is a presentation on CSW. Uh, by one of our uh, committee member, Humaira Sharifi. And Humaira has been working uh, for organizations that work especially in the area of gender equality and women empowerment for over three years, including Afghan Youth Ambassador for Peace Organization, APNGO CSW, and Afghanistan Unites as Youth Representative and Women's Rights Advocate. She has recently joined Global Network of Women Peace Builders as Youth Peace Building Influencer. In addition, she was peer mentor for freshman 30 female students at the American University of Afghanistan, Afghanistan for two semesters. Her passion has always been to support young women in Afghan society. She graduated from American University of Afghanistan in spring 2021 with dual concentration in operations management and finance. Her education background is in business administration, has helped her to serve as a youth representative inside and outside of Afghanistan. Her, commu her communication skills and leadership skills may be confirmed independently on TEDx. Fionica U website, AUAF website, NGO CSW NY New York websites, and she especially enjoys public speaking, reading books and writing articles. And I would love to now hand over the floor for Homaira for our presentation today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gip, uh, for the beautiful introduction. Uh, so good morning uh, from Afghanistan to everyone on this call. I hope everyone is doing well and safe. Um, so, as we all know, today's training forum is about how to participate at the um, CSW. So today my presentation is largely addressed to those of you who have basic information about CSW and its history. So I'm going to share the screen. Mm -hmm. Um, everybody can see my screen? Yes, Samari, it looks great. Just give me a minute. So this one that I'm going to discuss in my presentation is a brief overview on the CSW. And what are the assisted NGOs CSW are? A CSW is Functional Commission of Economic and Social Council, a CSW member states, group of the commission, what's exactly happening in CSW, a brief uh, uh, history of the CSW, and also a brief overview of Beijing Declaration Platform for, uh, for Action, and also media of works in CSW, multi year program support and also the communication procedures uh, under CSW. Uh, here is, uh, what is the CSW? As we all know, uh, the Commission on the Status of Women is the principal global intergovernmental body exclusively dedicated to the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women. The Functional Commission of the Economic and Social Council, which was established in 1946, CSW is instrumental in promoting women's rights, documenting the reality of women's life 
throughout the world in shaping global uh, standards on gender equality and empowerment of women. CSW is uh, the biggest global policymaking body dedicated exclusively to promoting gender equality and the empowerment of women. UN Women as the Secretariat supports all aspects of uh, Commission's work. About the responsibility of CSW, we can say that initially CSW was to provide reports and recommendations to Economic and Social Council. However, after 1996, the duties and responsibilities were expanded beyond providing just reports and recommendations. The General Assembly decided that uh, CSW should take a leading role in monitoring and reviewing uh, progress and uh, problems in the implementations of Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, and in in streaming and gender perspective in UN activities. The sister uh, NGO uh, CSWs are uh, NGO CSW Africa, Asia Pacific, Geneva, Latin America, Caribbean, New York, and Vienna. And these are the logos for each of these NGOs that I've put on the both side of uh, the slides. Uh, CSW as the functional uh, Commission of uh, Economic and Social Council. Uh, the Economic and Social Council under the overall authority of the General Assembly coordinates the economic and social work of the United Nations and the UN families of our organizations. It consults uh, the NGOs, thereby uh, maintaining a vital linkage between the United Nations and civil society. The work of the Economic and Social Council involves so many issues. It has many commissions to help it. And one of these commissions is the Functional Commissions. The CSW, our Commission on the Status of Women, came under Functional Commission. CSW provides um, reports and recommendations to Economic and Social Council on the Status of Women. CSW member states. Uh, for five member states of the uh, United uh, Nations service, uh, the member of the commission for four years, uh, 13 members from Africa, 11 members from Asia Pacific, nine members from Latin American Caribbean, eight members from Western Europe and other states, and four from Eastern Europe. They all serve for four years. And the brew of the commission, the brew of the commission plays a crucial role in facilitating the uh, preparation for and in ensuring the successful outcome of annual session of the commission. So the brew uh, member serves for two years, each uh, from one uh, region, one from Africa, uh, one from Latin American Caribbean, one from Western Europe, one from Eastern Europe, and one from Asian Pacific. What's happening in uh, CSW exactly? So as, as I explained earlier, the CSW was established in 1946. So for uh, the course of uh, 70 years, the committee has worked hard to uh, address inequalities and discriminations uh, the women and girls have faced throughout these years. And also the committee has uh, generated public attention on social taboos and uh, broken stereotypes. It has uh, driven action to advance the right of women and girls everywhere around the world. There are uh, official meetings uh, such as annual sessions each year. Uh, annual session is the biggest gathering uh, of gender equality advocates in the world. And this session takes place in New York uh, for two weeks every year. Uh, in the annual session, the member states discuss progress, set policies, and identify challenges, and set global standards on gender equality and the rights of women and girls. This discussion leads to, uh, um, uh, to an outcome called agreed conclusions. And besides the official meetings, we have uh, sideline events such as uh, side events and parallel events that are open to public. I mean, not only NGOs with a consultative status can join uh, the meeting, but also the public, other NGOs that do not have the um, consultative status with Economic and Social Council can join the parallel event and side events that are happening in uh, CSW. Coming to the CSW history, 
1946 is known as the birth of the commissions on the status of women. United Nations commitment to the advancement of women began with the signing of the United Nations Charter in San Francisco in 1945. A few days later, the Subcommission on the Status of Women was established under the uh, Commission of Human Rights. Many women delegates and representatives of NGO believed, nevertheless, that a separate body specifically dedicated to women, uh, to women's issue, uh, is necessary. And also the uh, Economic and Social Council for the first time uh, established in this year. Uh, in June uh, 21st, 1946, subcommission formally became a commission on the status of women as a full-fledged commission under the Economic and Social Council. It was uh, dedicated to ensuring women's equality and promoting women's rights. In 1947 to 1962, the commission focused on securing the legal foundation of gender equality. In 1963 to 1975, during this decade, the Commission worked on promoting the participations of women on a development. In 1976 to 1985, uh, this decade is called the United Nations Decades for Women. Commissions contribute to bringing further legitimacy to the international women's movement and move uh, women's issue forward on the global agenda. In 1986 to 1995, uh, uh, the commission worked hard to put women on the global agenda. In 1996 to 2005, CSW focused on advancing uh, um, progress for women. In 2006 onwards, uh, CSW focused on uh, um, accelerating the realizations of gender equality and empowerment of women. Uh, throughout the history, there are major achievements uh, in each of these decades. Uh, in 1947 to 1962, uh, the major achievements that CSW had was at the first session uh, that was uh, happened in Lake Saxis in New York City in 1947. All 15 government representatives that attended this session were women. And the other uh, major achievements during this decade was um, engaging in uh, discussions on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. CSW contributed to the drafting of the uh, International Bill of Rights as the Commission's uh, first task. And also, um, uh, CSW uh, provide women universal access to uh, political rights. The Commission made women's political rights a high priority in its early years of work. And also uh, removing discrimination in marriage was another uh, big initiative or major initiative that um, this uh, Commission has taken during this decade. In 1963 to 1975, uh, the major achievements was declaration on, on elimination of discrimination discrimination against women, which was adopted in 1967 by uh, General Assembly. And in 1975, uh, the commission recommended uh, uh, that 1975 should be a designated International Women's Year. And this uh, recommendation uh, endorsed by General Assembly. So uh, this year was intended to uh, remind the international community that discrimination against women entrenched in law and deeply rooted cultural beliefs. It would also encourage government NGOs and individuals to increase their efforts to promote equality between men and women and enhance their recognitions of uh, women contribution to development. And this was, uh, um, this was the biggest achievement during this period of time. And in 1976 to 1985, uh, the major achievements was uh, the, um, as I mentioned earlier, that this decade was uh, called United Nations Decades for Women. Uh, the commission contributed to bringing further legitimacy to the international women's movement and moved um, women's issue forward on the global agenda. And uh, Drafting the convention of CEDA was another major task that CSW accomplished during this time. And also uh, the second world conference uh, happened during this decade, uh, which was um, the biggest achievement for CSW. In 1986 to 1995, the commission began to meet annually instead of biennially. 
And uh, the other biggest achievement that uh, happened during this decade was the fourth uh, World Conference on Women uh, that happened in China in Beijing in 1995. Uh, and it was uh, significantly uh, focused on the advancement of a global agenda for women's uh, human rights and gender equality. During 1996 and 2005, during these decades, uh, the major achievement that happened was um, in 2000, uh, the General Assembly and the uh, recommendations of uh, CSW decided to hold its 23rd special session in order to conduct um, a five-year review and appraisal of the implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action and consider uh, further action initiatives in this regard. And it was the largest special session that the General Assembly ever held in New York. And also, uh, besides this, um, the CEDA protocol, gender, mainstreaming, and security council resolution uh, are the major achievements that happened during this time. And during 2006 to 2015, uh, the UN Women established as the um, United Nations entity for gender equality and women empowerment uh, and support all aspects of work of CSW. And uh, the other major achievement that happened during this decade was uh, the five-year uh, review and uh, appraisal of Beijing Declaration Platform for Action, an outcome of 23rd uh, special sessions of General Assembly. And uh, the last one is uh, 2015 to 2030, that during this time, the major uh, achievements that CSW has had was the 25, uh, 25th years of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action that happened in 2020. So these uh, were the major achievements that CSW had uh, throughout the story. NGO participation. The active participation of non-governmental organizations uh, is a crucial element in the work of CSW. Uh, NGO that are accredited and in a good standing with Economic and Social Council may designate uh, representatives to the annual session of the CSW. For that, we need to understand that what Economic and Social um, Council um, accreditation is. Non-governmental, non-profit, public, and voluntary organizations may formally contribute to the work of United Nations over, uh, after uh, being granted consultative status uh, with the Economic and Social Council. These accredited organizations may participate in meetings of council as well as the subsidiary bodies uh, such as CSW. Uh, Consultative status is, uh, is uh, granted by the Economic and Social Council upon recommendations of the committee and the NGO, which is composed of 19 members. And uh, recently, the CSW has 5,593 NGOs in active consultative status. Uh, in order to better understand uh, the uh, Economic and Social Council uh, consultative status, there are three different categories. Uh, one is a general consultative status, that is special consultative status, and that is roster consultative status. General consultative status is reserved uh, for large international NGOs whose area of work um, covers most of the issues on the agenda of Economic and Social Council and subsidiary bodies. Uh, however, in special, uh, special consultative status is granted to NGOs uh, which have a special competence in and are concerned specifically with uh, only a few of the you know, fields of uh, activities uh, covered by the uh, Economic and Social Council. And these NGOs uh, tends to be smaller and uh, newly established. And roster consultatives are NGOs that are uh, that have a formal status with um, UN uh, bodies and uh, special specialized agencies. Um, those are NGOs can be categorized under um, roster status. So you can check the status of your organization that which uh, uh, of these categories that your organization uh, commander. Participation in the UN event. Uh, so there are certain processes that uh, you have to follow as NGO uh, 
honor you, you can follow in order to participate in the uh, UN events. The first uh, step is uh, to have, you have to find out the registration links in the um, NGO branch of Economic and Social Council website. And then uh, you have to be sure that uh, the functional commissions of Economic and Social Council, the sessions that are happening under this commission uh, to take place in the spring of each year. So uh, all those organizations with consultative status, they can register in order to participate. And there are a pre-registration link. You cannot just directly go to the link and register uh, for a member of your organization, but there are a, a specific uh, platform uh, called Indico. You can have a, an account uh, under the system so that you are able to participate in, in UN events. And also uh, there should be uh, two focal points in order to review the individual registrations and member of the, for the member of your organizations in order to participate in all of the events. Uh, so yes. Here, uh, I would explain uh, the Beijing Declaration Platform for Action, uh, which is uh, the commission serves as the preparatory body for, uh, for the 1995 Ford World Conference on Women, which, ado which adopted the Beijing Declaration Platform for Action. Uh, after the conference, the commission was mandated by the General Assembly to play a central role in monitoring and implementing uh, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and advising economic and social council accordingly. Following the uh, 23rd special session of the General Assembly in 2000, uh, member states interested the commission to conduct subsequent five-year comprehensive review of the implementations of Beijing Platform for Action and uh, the outcome of uh, special sessions. Uh, so uh, this review happened in uh, 2005, in 2010, 2015, and the last one happened in 2020. Method of work uh, for CSW is uh, the commission adopts multi-year programs of work to appraise uh, progress and make further recommendations to accelerate the implementations of a platform fraction. Uh, these recommendations take place in the form of negotiated accurate conclusions uh, on the priority term. Uh, the Commission also contributes the uh, follow-up of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development uh, uh, to accelerate the realizations of gender equality and the empowerment of women. So, um, under the uh, current method of work, uh, the CSW, uh, each session, uh, the commission uh, at, at, at each session, the commission convenes a ministerial segment to reaffirm and strengthen political commitment to the realizations of gender equality and empowerment of women, engaged in general discussions on the status of gender equality, identifying goals attained, achievements made, and efforts under uh, a way to close gaps and meet challenges, convenes interactive expert panel discussions and other interactive dialogues on steps and initiatives to accelerate mainstreaming gender equality across policies and programs. Uh, and also consider um, one priority term being based on the Beijing Declaration Platform for Action and outcome of 23rd special sessions of the General Assembly and linkage between the 2030 uh, Agenda for Sustainable Development. And multi-year programs of work, uh, the commission elaborates uh, multi-year programs of work for the first time in 1987, containing priority terms for discussions and action as its annual sessions based on the economic and uh, social council resolutions 1987. So the um, uh, multi-year program of work for the year 2021 and 2024 is uh, uh, contained in the economic uh, and council a uh, economic and so social council resolutions of uh, 2020. Uh, I mean the team. Uh, the uh, I mean it's uh, the priority team and review team are uh, content uh, in advance in order to uh, take action accordingly. And you see that the 2022 uh, priority team for. Uh, um, uh, for the CSW is achieving gender equality and the 
empowerment of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs. And the review term for the for this year is the women's economic empowerment, the changing world of work. So in the same way for 2022. 2023 and 2024, the priority term already uh, in place. And here's the uh, communication procedures uh, for a CSW. So any individual NGOs uh, would like to submit their uh, communication to CSW, they can submit their complaint, appeals, and petitions uh, that are containing information relating to the alleged violations of uh, human rights and that affect the status of women all around the world. They can submit uh, their petition within a certain period of time. Um, the Commission on the Status of Women consider these uh, communication as part of their annual program and then they can take actions accordingly. And these are the facts, um, the frequently asked questions that I have put at the end of my presentations. So um, if you want to um, uh, read them, I can put my presentation on the website so that you can review all of this. So thank you so much for uh, your um, for listening to me. So I came to an end. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Omaira, for the wonderful and very informative um, presentation. Um, I would now like to uh, take you to our next section um, of the event, which is the panel discussion. And um, I would like to introduce the Committee Chair Carol Shaw, who will also be our moderator today. Um, Carol is the current co-chair of Asia Pacific NGO CSW and the UN representative for Asia Pacific Women's Watch. She is a visionary executive and a strategist with a demonstrated history of leadership roles focused on advancing women's rights and promoting gender equality around the world. Developing and driving high level strategies for nonprofit management, advocacy, stakeholder engagement, policy development, and strategy. Operating at a grassroots level with marginalized communities and at the policy level with governments and institutions, Carol led the Australian National Reviews on the Beijing Platform for Action for Beijing Plus Five, Plus 10, Plus 15, Plus 20, and Plus 21. Plus 25, I'm sorry, <laughs> plus 25. With a focus on human rights and gender equality, she is highly skilled in gender policy, international relations, international policy, nonprofit organization, government program evaluation, lecturing, grassroots activists, and volunteer management. Carol works within a, an intersectional human rights framework to support the capacity of the national organization to engage and advocate for social justice, equity, and empowerment of women and girls. She's a thought leader in movement building to advocate the rights of women and girls, ensure gender inclusion policies and financing and justice, as well as address structural barriers to, to women's access to resources and advancement. <laughs> it's very That's impressive. A very long. It sounds like a job description. <laughs> it's a very, it's a very uh, impressive, uh, you know, um, profile. And, uh, and now I would uh, like to, uh, to hand over to Carol, our moderator, for today's uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gib, for that enormous <laughs> introduction. Um, I am in Australia and I would first like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land and waters and air in which we meet today. Um, I work a play on the lands at the moment of the Kamaregal clan of the Gurungai nation and I wish to pay my respects to honour their elders past, present and emerging and any other community leaders and Indigenous groups that we may have here today. I acknowledge that sovereignty in Australia has never been ceded in battle or bargain, and that we are on lands that are and always will be Aboriginal lands. So I feel that's a really important place to start because I think um, when we start to look at change, we need to also acknowledge where we've come from. So I um, have been invited to be the coordinator of 
the amazing panel today. Now, we've had a little few hitches. So we have four key speakers that will be speaking to us today from different perspectives. Um, Adela Khan, Danica Gonzalez, Lasana Tuiravi. Tui Ravi Ravi. How do you say that, Lasana? Tui Ravi Ravi? And Bobby Chow. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are having a little bit of a hitch with the dealer as uh, she's currently in the UK and I believe it's 3.30 in the morning for her. So I'm not quite certain what's happened. Um, I would like to um, start. Uh, I think what we will do is we'll I'll introduce each speaker before we go into a little bit of a discussion and then we can have a, a question and answer at the end if we may. So we'll start with Lasana in the Pacific, which is the area in which I'm in. Um, and Lasana Tui Ravi Ravi is the team leader of the Intergenerational Women's Leadership Program for the Fiji Women's Rights Movement in Fiji. She is passionate about women's empowerment, began her journey with the women's rights movement through the Emerging Leaders Forum in 2009. The Emerging Leaders Forum is a flagship program of Fiji women's rights that builds the capacity of young women to critically analyze issues and develop advocacy skills. And she's also an alumni member of the Emerging Leaders Forum. This is fantastic. I was involved in the Emerging Leaders Forum many years ago. Um, sometime between Beijing plus five and Beijing plus 10. It's a, a very amazing program that brings a lot of young women who are now very strong um, feminist advocates in the Pacific. Um, at Lasana, at uh, CSW, Fiji works collaboratively with other Pacific Island states and often the Pacific will have NGO representation embedded into the government delegation at CSW. As a member of Fiji Women's Rights and a strong Pacific woman, um, would you please share with us your insights and experiences of preparing for and participating in CSW? And also maybe explain, if you can, how the Pacific Island states come together in preparation for CSW at both the state and NGO level and any opportunities there are to participate in those events. Thank you, Lasana. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Carol, for the introduction. And uh, yes, Pacific uh, uh, greetings to everyone. Um, uh, yes, so uh, just in response to the uh, question that has been posed uh, across, uh, first of all, I just like to uh, highlight um, the organization that I work for. Uh, so that I can make some linkages in terms of the question that has been posed. Um, so I work for the Fiji Women's Rights Movement, which was established in 1986, and it is a multi-ethnic and multicultural non-government organization that is committed to removing all forms of discrimination against uh, women through institutional reform and attitudinal change. I will provide the web link uh, once I finish up my uh, presentation so you can have a look at some of the um, leading key work that uh, we have been uh, doing here in Fiji and also in the Pacific. Um, just before I move on with my presentation, um, please just, uh, apologies from my end um, because my children are... here at home. Um, they just might be, uh, but otherwise. Um, so uh, to continue on, uh, in terms of FWRM's engagement uh, in spaces with other human rights organizations um, in the Pacific is a key area of the work of the organization. And through coalitions and participation in Pacific regional processes and uh, events. FWRM is a part of the We Rise Coalition, which is one of the seven organizations that is spread throughout the Pacific. So there is seven organizations in six countries, and these organizations are either young women-led, they are feminist organizations that are working on diverse issues and diverse uh, constituencies with the aim of strengthening feminist movement building in the Pacific in order to grow and uphold inclusive governance, um, equality, diversity, justice, and women's human rights in the region. 
Um, as part of uh, the We Rise Coalition, FWRM has engaged in regional events such as the 13th and the recent 14th Triennial Conference that took place last year and the 14th con uh, Triennial Conference of Pacific Women and the 7th Meeting of the Pacific Ministers for Women is a Pacific regional event that brought together decision makers, development partners, research institutions and civil society organizations. And the event offered a platform to share and reflect on challenges that um, which included the impacts of COVID-19 and natural and humanitarian disasters on women and girls and progress made to identify strategic and practical measures and propose recommendations towards gender equality and the full realization of women's human rights in the Pacific. Um, in terms of um, our participation in Triennial, we are also part of the steering committee and later on the program and drafting committees during the event. And as we rise coalition partners, we also organized a side event uh, that, it's, that was titled Women in the Blue Pacific, Leading Response and Recovery in Times of Crisis. And some of the key highlights in terms of the agreed uh, upon outcome document uh, from the Triennial included um, implement policies, legislation, and gender responsive budgets in compliance with agreed regional and international standards and conventions to address disparities with regard to women's access and opportunities in all fields of economic activity, proactively expand opportunities for women to participate in critical sectors and industries. Equal, um, equally uh, acknowledge, value, and remunerate women's work in all fields. Um, also in terms of uh, gender-based uh, violence, um, to invest in and strengthen contextualized evidence-based GBV prevention programs that work with uh, children and young people and ensure that violence prevention is integrated into formal and informal education curricula. So those were just some of the few uh, points that I picked up from the uh, outcomes uh, documents of the triennial. I will also uh, be sharing the link um, for those of you that are interested to uh, read through. Um, the meeting that happened uh, last year from the triennial. Um, in terms of uh, FWRM's participation at uh, CSW, uh, we were part of the Pacific Gender Technical Working Group, which this year has been part of the Pacific preparations, um, also for Beijing Platform for Action Plus 25 review process. We have been part of the CSO steering committee at the Asia Pacific level as well. And for this year, um, FWRM's executive director was invited to be part of the expert group which were papers and met to put together the report on the key theme for CSW. We have joined our um, regional partners, um, Asia Pacific Forum on Women Law and Development and Asia Pacific Women's Watch and others for joint calls and strategies, as well as globally, we joined the Women's Rights um, Caucus. For FWRM, we also organized the Pacific Feminist Forum, which is another space that uh, we uh, provide together over 150 feminist and women's rights organizations by annually and the pff is aimed at strengthening the pacific connection as the first uh, forum of its kind and a way of bringing together feminist women's human rights defenders and advocates from across the region to share ideas, experiences, and strategize on ways of moving forward. And this year, we will be holding the space for the third Pacific Feminist Forum and being the first to be organized since COVID-19 pandemic uh, hit the world. Um, these spaces and coalitions often discuss challenges and barriers impacting women and tackle issues that ensure the participation of women in decision-making spaces and full recognition of women's uh, rights. The creation, the creation of the Charter of uh, Pacific Feminist Principle was a key outcome of the PFF uh, and which had set out a collective principles that will guide our work as feminists within the Pacific region. The PFF Charter and Action Plan sets out the collective principles that are key to our work as Pacific feminists. And the charter is a living document and is intended to guide our analysis and practice. 
Um, so for those of you that are interested to uh, look through the um, Pacific Feminist Charter and Action Plan from the last two uh, events that has been organized, um, the web link that I will share later on, um, the FWRM web link though, uh, that contains more information about the PFF and also the Charter and the Action Plan. So in each of these spaces, the program as part of the We Rise Coalition aims to create, nurture and sustain the spaces we have. And we ensure that we leverage resources to have diverse feminist and women's rights advocates to participate in these key spaces. And this is especially important as the Pacific often has very low representation in these spaces and um, now with the fast shrinking spaces, it is more important to have us there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lasana. It was very interesting. They, um, and we'll be posting any questions to Lasana at the end of the, the panel. I'll give each of you a chance to speak and then we'll um, have a look at some of the issues. That's fascinating around the, um, that you were able to hold the Third Pacific um, feminist forum again that, that since COVID that will be an absolutely amazing event um, and I look forward to hearing more about that as it progresses. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker in the panel which will be uh, Bobby. Um, Bobby Trower is the Senior Manager for Advocacy at the YWCA in Australia. Bobby has spent the last 15 years professionally honing their intersectional feminist understandings, living with their authentic true self as a non-binary member of the LGBTQI plus community. They have expertise in policy, domestic violence, development impact measurement, gender responsiveness, and are helping to shape Australia's gender equality sector and its understanding of gender inclusiveness, pushing language, policy progress, and barriers along the way. Bobby created the YWCA members a campaign future. The future is intersectional for the UN at CSW 63 with the aim to strive for the critical evolution of feminist movements. Um, Bobby is a key mover and shaker in the women's sector in Australia and well known to myself uh, for the work which uh, they do. Through their work at the Y, they bring a unique perspective to raising the voices of young women, especially in the preparations for CSW and engagement at CSW. Bobby, you've been instrumental in using digital and online means to engage, participate and mobilise around CSW and have led the digital charge on advocacy and safety online. Would you, uh, could you please share your perspectives on why to engage at CSW, how to participate, especially in the current context where everything is online and um, the challenges are of digital, the digital divide is a true divide. Over to you, Bobby. Thanks, Carol. Hi everyone. And, and thank you to Lasana for that uh, wonderful chat just before. Um, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm coming from today and throughout Australia. I'm on the land of the Gadigal people. So I would like to pay my respects to the continuing connection to the land, the sea, and the waters and culture of Australia. And uh, pay my respects to elders past and present and anybody joining us today. Um, CSW is uh, always a wonderful thing to talk about. It's such a major piece of uh, gender equality mechanism that we can all be involved with. I think this year's priority theme probably highlights more than most what we need to come together as, as a global gender equality progressive union, in that this year we're focusing particularly on climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but I feel like those three things are things that over the last two or three years, as a global community, we've all experienced in various ways, but mostly and largely to negative impact. For us, uh, CSW is a really interesting uh, piece in the calendar. Um, as a mainly young women's advocacy organization in regards to our policy and advocacy action, um, CSW is that kind of mythical piece in the calendar of the year um, that lots of young women and young gender diverse people are very keen to know more about, but don't necessarily have any ways to connect. So for us at YWC Australia, um, we have an evolving uh, focus. We're now focusing a lot more on housing and homelessness, which in the CSW space can be quite tricky to talk about, which is why we're so committed to young women's leadership at the same time. We see these massive gender equality mechanisms like CSW 
as a really important, not only as building a pipeline of young people to become more engaged, more knowledgeable about the mechanisms that exist, but also creating, uh, I guess, a journey and a sharing journey, a networking journey for people to be able to feel like you don't have to be a feminist expert or a policy expert or part of a government delegation to get something and contribute something to CSW. Um, and I guess the, the digital engagement that we've seen, particularly over last year and this year, forced because of COVID, has really allowed us to diversify uh, our inclusion of people who probably wouldn't traditionally be able to hop on a plane to New York and Australia and travel all of that way. So I guess for us, there are um, sort of main objectives for us that are probably similar to many other organizations. CSW allows us to maintain and strengthen the relationship with our own government in Australia, particularly for the Office for Women and also DFAT, which is a really important relationship for us to hold. It's also really important for us to be able to introduce and, and also elevate young women's voices in these arenas, and particularly through decision-making processes. So CSW can not only be a mechanism for us to be able to connect people with government and power holders, but really give them a, a, a really good, solid and safer way to be able to share and, and learn at the same time. For us, because we have a platform that reaches outside of the international uh, gender equality mechanism space, like we are largely focused on domestic issues, this gives us an opportunity to increase not only the sectors that we're in, so the housing, gender and violence sectors in Australia, but also the civil society awareness more broadly. And we have lots of people who follow us because of our stance on gender equality. So it's a really good time for us to engage with NGO CSW, host our own parallel events, and be able to allow for young women's perspectives to be centered and amplified through that process. So digitally speaking, uh, next week, we open up our delegation, not delegation application process. So this year, because you can't get into the accredited side events in the same way that we would have had last year, um, our digital delegation is sort of an unofficial one. Whereas last year, because both of those processes were open, we could still call it an official delegation as everybody had to go through postdoc accreditation. This year, it's slightly different, but it allows us to still build on those digital channels that we've created in the first place. So for us at YWC Australia, we're going to be utilizing a Slack platform that we have built, which even has intersectional feminist bots built into it. Who knew technology could do that for us? Um, but in that space, it allows us for a safer space for people to join a pre and post forum to CSW, so to set the scene and then to be able to explain and show the impact and how that will follow us in our advocacy for the rest of the year at the end. And then in the middle, we, we take a concept which we've built on for a few years now, which is more of a choose your own adventure, which allows young people to select parallel events and perhaps opportunities that are held by other wise and other allies and be exposed to different types of areas that we may not have a focus on, but others do. So for example, a couple, we had um, over 80 delegates uh, for CSW last year, and we're expecting a similar amount this year. And it really, really does help um, really hone that understanding to meaningfully engage with advocacy across a spectrum of opportunities. So for us during that two weeks, we're a member of the Young Women's Rights Caucus, the SOGI Caucus and the Young Feminist Caucus. They all have activities going on. This is a really good way for us to keep across that and share that with an Australian audience, which is one of the key parts of what we do. So not only are we committed to intersectional feminism through the process of CSW, but we're consistently engaging with our members and our staff in our advocacy and the work, the broader work of the commission. So people feel like they're connected to the caucuses, even if they're not directly involved with them, or that language and advocacy concepts are explored and explained in ways that don't make, make people feel alienated or that they feel excluded from the discussion, which sometimes, as we all know, these official channels can, can usually feel a bit intimidating, especially for younger women and gender diverse people when they're starting out. They don't know the networks, they don't know the people that they're sharing with, and it can be hard to understand because it's a very complex process. So for us, we use uh, so, all sorts of different techniques. Um, over the last few years, we've worked with a First Nations uh, jewelry designer to create the future as intersectional earrings, which we then sell on our online shop. We then create merch around CSW. So we've got some really cool graphics. Uh, when we used to go to New York with the Statue of Liberty and CSW, we've also created gifts, which um, I don't know if anybody's seen on Instagram, 
um, but they've been viewed over 3 million times and utilized 3 million times over the last couple of years. And what we do is we build those messages around that. So for example, our feminism isn't feminism unless it's intersectional. We created that into a gift, package it up around CSW and it can be used by many delegates. It's also a really unique opportunity for us to maintain and strengthen the relationships that we have with our global movement. So Worldwide WCA are usually heavily involved and um, also the uh, Rise Up um, program, which is uh, throughout the Pacific as well, is a good opportunity to bring young women who are involved in that uh, with Australian young women and be able to create a space and a dialogue for connection. It also it increases the awareness around, among all our supporters and the wider community around the intersections between young women's leadership, international gender equality mechanisms, and then why our governments are accountable in the first place. Their signatories to CSW's agreed conclusions. And then subsequent advocacy back in our home countries is about, well, you've signed up to that. This year is of particular importance to us because Australia hasn't done brilliantly in the climate space internationally, as you all may know. And lots of us have explaining extremely guilty for that, given that we are so connected to First Nations caring for the land and, and how uh, climate disaster is impacting bushfires, the degradation of forests, and also uh, culturally significant places in this country, as well as places like the Great Barrier Reef, who everybody knows about but is under extreme threat due to climate inaction. We try to measure things. Uh, we've got lots of metrics that allow us that people, to see what people are interested in and, and what they're actually focused on. But for us, CSW is this really great space to continue to build up the future is intersectional campaign, bringing the intersections from climate, economic stability, youth leadership and safety, and our own obligations as a member state are the things that we focus on. It's not easy to uh, host digital communications across these channels, but as with many communication strategies, going back to basics works really well. So we find with such a large delegation, regular emails, regular opportunities to share, like and engage in different forums are really cool. And then being able to open up um, people being involved in panels or helping organize certain things gives everybody a role in a very complex situation where they, again, may feel like they can't be involved because they don't know enough. It also allows us to springboard off International Women's Day, which is a really important part in most of our calendars, um, but it can really ally that campaign messaging that we have and position us as not only an investor and a supporter of young women's leadership, but really that transformative change piece, how we can promote resources, how we can bring people into a wider feminist movement that may not have had that connection before. Around 30% of our participants last year weren't YWCA members, they joined specifically for CSW and then remain engaged post that engagement. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to really push those different types of leadership models. Um, something may be trending on Twitter, but for young people, unless it's being shared as an infographic as part of an Insta story, it may actually not be resonating with them. So it does allow us to use that digital know-how and the digital connections that we have to really really push messaging quite hard as a collective, um, which is really cool. And it also gives us an opportunity to open up to the delegation to express themselves creatively as well. So we get lots of people designing their own things, explaining CSW to others in their own language. And this is really about, again, building that pipeline. There aren't many people in our country that can readily drop everything and be involved in providing nuanced language updates and advice. Um, and I guess that's what we're all really mindful of is that there's a, there's, there's a real gap there for us to build that. And so we're really committed to not only through digital engagement, but through opening up and demystifying some of the processes around CSW to really get young uh, people involved more broadly. Um, so I could keep talking about lots of different things, but I think I'm gonna uh, round it out there and uh, yeah, take questions at the end. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Bobby. I always love to hear how you speak. You go through so many things and I'm already thinking, oh, there's this to do and there's that to do. You're just so inspiring. Thank you so much for that. We'll hold questions for the end. Um, I'll introduce our, I think it's going to be our final speaker on this panel. It looks like Adil is not going to be able to join us today, unfortunately. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Danica Gonzalez. She is the 
Um, Southeast Asian Women's Watch, uh, member of the Secretariat for Southeast Asian Women's Watch and the coordinator for the Young Women's Leadership Program of the Women and Gender Institute in the Philippines. Um, the Women and Gender Institute, WAGI, aims to bring young women together through various spaces, hone leadership skills, encourage them to uphold gender equality, human rights and inclusion. Her other advocacies include women, peace, security, sexual health and education, reproductive rights and the environment. And she's currently taking her master's degree in anthropology at the European, at the University of the Philippines in um, Dilmun. So D Danny, um, Southeast, Women, Southeast Asia Women's Watch, yes, Sea Watch, um, is a long-standing sub-regional organization with its secretariat in the Philippines. It works to strengthen and build on the platform for action, the Beijing platform for action that was mentioned by Hamari earlier, and uh, is a standing member of the Asia Pacific Women's Watch um, regional organization. As a sub-regional organization, why is it important to work on CSW and how do you prepare and participate? And if you can, would you also like to share the different ways in which you can link into participation on CSW and the Beijing platform for issues through Sea-Watch? Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Carol. Uh, let me just share my screen. I prepared a very short presentation for this. Um, and the flow will be just briefly, I'd like to highlight Sea Watch and what we do and our goals in Sea Watch, uh, a little bit on our membership. And the meat of this presentation will be really the gains that we have had in participating in CSW and how we actually participate in CSW, some of our best practices and frequently asked questions of how people can engage in CSW through Sea Watch or um, other organizations like APWW. Right, so as mentioned, So Sea Watch uh, stands for the Southeast Asia Women's Watch, and it's a network of organizations and individuals really committed to the renewed and reinvigorated efforts at the implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action, um, focused especially in the Southeast Asian region. So specifically, we want to revive attention, appreciation, and commitment to the BPFA, uh, uh, which, which we consider as the most comprehensive and progressive uh, blueprint for women's rights and empowerment, and to aggressively push for the fast tracking of its implementation, uh, promote discussion of new and emerging issues that may have not been present during its birth, and create champions for the BPFA across generations and across the Southeast Asian region, and of course, to help reawaken the feminist fervor of Beijing. And Sea Watch was established in 1997, shortly after the UN Fourth World Conference on Women held in Beijing in 1999. The convener of Sea Watch is Dr. Patricia Likwanan, and she was the chair of the UN Commission on the Status of Women as the preparatory commission for the Fourth World Conference on Women and the chair of the main committee that negotiated the platform for action in 1995. So Dr. Likwanan is still very much active in Sea Watch and in, in this, uh, in her advocacy and in Sea Watch's advocacy. So currently we have members in the countries listed here and a regional network, uh, ASEAN Soji Caucus. And you know, something we'd like to highlight in Sea Watch's membership is its quality of being intergenerational in the ways that we work and in our membership. That has really helped deepen the dialogue around women's issues. And this is something that I think uh, Bobby and our previous speakers have uh, mentioned as well that, uh, you know, having youth participate really does change how discussions around women, women's issues uh, occur. And uh, this is a real life example of uh, an event that we had, but this was back in 2019, really to, that has really attempted to bring in young women from Southeast Asia with more seasoned women of CSW. Uh, and in this one, we, map, we mapped out the most relevant issues that concern uh, young women in the issue. So, next. Right. So now gains from CSW. So CSW is coming up 
And before we ask how we can participate, we also must ask why we want to participate, right? And Sea Watch's experience tells us that organizations and individuals have really more to lose if they don't participate. So CSW has done a lot for women and we cannot discount the importance of the UN as a whole. So it's really important that we remain engaged through CSW. And CSW is the only platform that has highlighted and sustained the BPFA for about 25 years at this point. CSW has always carried the themes of the BPFA in the context of contemporary developments. So we've also found that um, CSW provides a platform for government to showcase their achievements as well as challenges in implementing the BPFA. And as organizations, as TSOs, this is very uh, important information to make our to make the work that we want to do possible. And it's also a platform, of course, to inform and update ourselves on the women's issues across the region. We may be, as organizations, you know, we may be advocating for the same issues, but we will always have different experiences. Um, next, it's an opportunity as well to find best practices that we can perhaps implement in our own organizations and communities as well. And it brings national organizations together as one voice for feminist issues, for women's issues, and thus it, you, you know, we become a stronger push for government to act on women's issues that we want to resolve. Um, going back to CSW being a platform to inform, CSW has also become a forum for the active participation of NGOs and CSOs to identify and discuss current issues and trends in the global uh, women's movement. And it's also a mechanism for checks and balances to hold governments accountable through the shadow reports that are submitted and NGO participation. We are able to really see if implementation has been accurate, if reports have been accurate, and otherwise, what we can do to uh, change that. Um, it also provides, Sea Watch has you know, found that CSW provides an opportunity for organizations and countries, of course, to collaborate. Um, it facilitates dialogue about women's issues and organizational issues. And I wanna highlight this, um, this particular point on organizational issues. Many of our, you know, Sea Watch has found that by engaging in CSW, and this is in relation to the next point, uh, it fosters sisterhood and support for fellow activists. Um, by engaging in CSW, Sea Watch members have been able to link up with other national organizations. And in those, you know, in between all the meetings and all the discussions and forums and preparations for CSW, they've also found, you know, a form of sisterhood and support um, as fellow feminists and activists, you know, who, and, you know, as, as activists ourselves and as advocates, we know that fatigue is very real. So, this is something you know, CSW has uh, really been, has brought to organizations of Sea Watch. And the next, last, um, also, Sea Watch has shared the sentiments that you know, participating in CSW has been a venue for everyone for lifelong and meaningful relationships that has really made a difference in the participants' life. Uh, many of our members in Sea Watch are how I would like to call them, you know, veterans who've been at CSW for years and years. And they found that engaging in CSW has really shaped, um, in many ways, shaped their life, uh, has made a difference in the ways that they work, in their ways as feminists. And um, that alone is honestly a really good reason to be participating in CSW. So we also want to highlight here other ways to participate in CSW and we want to note specifically that there are plenty of ways to participate in CSW beyond the March events and that's not something that many people realize I think especially those for uh, especially for those who are just engaging in CSW. So 
at a national level, Sea Watch members, you know, begin by setting specific agendas that they want to bring into the forthcoming uh, CSW review. Um, said agendas are followed by forums, interviews, FGDs, and similar methods of consultation with stakeholders to feed the agenda that they want to bring to CSW. I have uh, specific examples later from our members that I can share with you as part of our best practices. That was done in 2021, really to feed into CSW 66 that's coming up in March. And then Sea Watch members collaborate as well with their respective women's commissions or government delegations to shape the way that their countries, uh, to shape their country's CSW agenda before we reach March. Um, and then we also have side events. So whether you are uh, whether you are a registered organization with ECOSOC status, um, you can apply, of course, and as an organization for a side event. But otherwise, you may also attend as an individual. And Sea Watch members have done both. There are years where Sea Watch um, was not able to to participate inside events, but has really made it a point to apply even as individuals because engagement is important and supporting CSW is important. I'd also like to highlight that Sea uh, Watch, as, as an organization and not just our individual members, also conducts uh, year-long meetings and webinars and information campaigns and training for feminist leaders in Southeast Asia that feed into preparations for CSW. And again, I will present this as uh, one of our best practices in succeeding slides. And then again, we'd like to highlight, you know, post-CSW, Sea uh, Watch does hold meetings and forums with women's commissions you know, in our respective countries and stakeholders to discuss how to localize and operationalize the opportunities and findings and best practices that they found from attending CSW. And again, participation doesn't just end in March. Uh, there are other ways to engage with CSW of which Sea Watch has done, and you know we encourage you to do so as well. And one is by participating in the shadow reports or in the creation of the shadow reports, which are very very important because shadow reports um, is basically you know information submitted by our NGOs, our CSOs, to treaty monitoring bodies that address omissions, deficiencies, or inaccuracies. Um, in the official government reports submitted by your respective administrations. So this is put together by NGOs and CSOs, and you can contribute to that as part of your engagement in CSW. And then, of course, within the year, there are alternative CSW events to engage in. So if in case you know you don't get to participate in March, uh, because as well, we have to know that because we're doing this online, sometimes the time zone can be uh, very tricky. So it'll be good to flag that there are alternative events that get the ear of CSW where you and your agenda can be heard. All right, so some of our best practices that we have done to prepare for CSW. Um, we have done training with Southeast Asian leaders where the BPFA, the Beijing Platform for Action, is used as a framework for feminist leadership. And these, the participants for this training were women in government positions, women who already have influence. And apart from trying to foster you know, feminist leadership in them, uh, this was a way to get them more engaged with CSW, or at the very least, you know, have them become more aware of CSW and its process and the Beijing platform for action as a whole. And hopefully, because they are in government and potentially part of their delegation, as a way, the training serving as a way for them to be more responsive to CSOs who also want to engage in CSW. So Sea Watch will rerun this training in 2022. So please uh, get in touch if this is something you want to participate in. Right. And 
As previously mentioned, Sea Watch members also hold forums, FGDs, and other meetings to share their experiences and influence government and other organizations to support their specific agendas and advocacies. This is an example from the Institute of Women's Empowerment uh, in Tunisia. So they had a forum. This was done in 2021 to have government and civil societies in other countries support elimination of girls' uh, child marriage. So this forum is going to feed into the participation. Sea uh, Watch is in Indonesia's participation in CSW 66. Right. And as well, we cannot emphasize enough the importance of bringing in or bringing together rather seasoned CSLB women, seasoned feminists with younger women and new groups and new organizations in the region. And I think, you know, after uh, Bobby emphasizing uh, what we can do to engage digitally now is the best time to do so because we don't need to take flights to New York to engage. We can just register online and still, you know, begin making that impact we want to make. So uh, the importance really of bringing younger women and new organizations in the region. And we hope this is something you can replicate, sorry, replicate in your respective organizations and community so we can bring more people in, in general, to CSW and have them engage continuously, especially, you know, hoping that the pandemic uh, gets better this year, maybe by next CSW, we'll be able to participate in person. Now, some frequently asked questions. Um, the first one is the zero draft and agreed conclusions the same now this is a very technical question and if anyone from the committee would like to further clarify on my answer please do so but the answer is no so the the zero draft is the first draft released months before csw in march and the agreed conclusions is the principal output of csw sessions containing the analysis and highlights related to the year's theme so that comes after csw basically now, um, we don't know other organizations who participate in CSW. Like, what do we do? So, what now? So, you can still join as an individual if you cannot find your organization in time or start seeking, actively seeking out an umbrella organization and get involved with them. So, some of these organizations include Sea Watch and APWW and other organizations uh, present here today as part of your organizing committee. So, get in touch with them. Now, we are a youth organization. Can we still join and engage in CSW? Yes, you can. And I think this is one of the best parts about CSW. Um, when, you know, CSW was still being done in person, there are attendees as young as 12 years old, you know, engaging in CSW. So yes, uh, a youth, youth organizations are very, very much welcome in CSW and in uh, Sea Watch in particular and many of your organizations, you may be surprised to find that they are welcoming of youth organizations. Now, we are not a registered organization. I'm an individual who wants to participate. Can I still get involved? And again, yes, you can still get involved. Individual participation is actually is just as valuable, honestly, if not more valuable. So attend forums, attend side events, and speak up. Your agenda will likely be picked up. And we have had you know, several examples of this happening where individual participants, not necessarily part of an organization, speak up because the issue affects them. And oh, the internet is unstable. Right. So there have been instances of individuals attending side events and forums as themselves, and they turned the tide on discussions and the advocacy and the the, you know, how the issue is being discussed in general. So attend even as an individual, you'd be surprised at how much you can contribute. And then next, our advocacy does not fit the priority theme and review theme. Can we still participate? And is it still worth participating or attending it? And the answer is yes. 
um, even if your advocacy does not fit the priority theme, you can, you know, we see watch always recognize trying to find, we believe in the you know, concept of intersectionality as feminists. So find the intersections with your advocacy and themes. And the theme this year is on environment. So if your um, advocacy is on conflict and for our speaker who unfortunately could not make it on SRHR, there will be linkages there. And try to bring those in even as an individual you'll be surprised at how much the discussion can change and can even improve because of your um, contribution. Exactly for the fact that you are not, you know, you are not aligned necessarily with the priority theme. And next, is it still worth participating in? Again, yes, it is still worth participating in, even as an individual. Uh, the opportunities for networking alone is well worth it. Um, for networking, I mean, with other organizations, with country delegations, and with like-minded individuals who talk about the same issues as you do, who believe in the same issues, and who will likely will want to work together to uh, address said issues. So yes, um, even if it does not fit your advocacy, we still encourage you to attend. And then, of course, we're not from Southeast Asia, but we would like to get involved in CSW and Sea Watch. How can we do this? So get in touch with us and get in touch with the organizers or us, and then we can link you to them. Um, you just have to send us a message or an email. But again, involvement does not mean you have to be in a formal organization. So please get involved. And that is the end of my presentation. So for those wanting to get in touch, here's our email and our contact details. Thank you, Danny. That was very enlightening. And um, I love the way that you spoke about the building of the sisterhood. Um, for myself, when I first got engaged in this work, it was Dr. Lequan and who was um, on the pedestal speaking to us. And now I'm so happy to say she's a friend and a colleague and, and a confidant that we can work collaboratively with and the extent of the way that you can shift and change in your own thinking through engagement with, um, with, with different groups around the Commission on the Status of Women, the Beijing Platform for Action and the um, events, you know, the key priority things really does enlarge your thinking and brings you into focus. Um, so we have three wonderful speakers. Apologies from um, Amina, who is not uh, able to meet us today. We, Adela, sorry. Um, we are now open for any questions from the floor. If you would like to uh, ask a question of any of our panelists today, please feel free to either put up your hand and we will try and see you in the... Um, I have two people tracking who is putting their hand up. Otherwise, um, put your question into the chat panel. And maybe, is there, is there any hands up at the moment? Can anyone see any hands up, Dylan of us? Carol, there are no hands up at the moment, but is there an opportunity for people to post questions, post this event on our website? Yes, uh, if you would like to um, think a little bit more about what was said um, or any of the questions and, uh, you know, any questions you may have, we can certainly put it through the contact sheet on the A A Asia Pacific NGO CSW webpage um, website, which is uh, www.apngo csw.org i can certainly put that address in um i would like to just ask one sort of question that i think um i'd like to address to all of the panelists if i may and that is around each of you have spoken about the shrinking space of civil society and what we've heard through these all of these presentations is that there's a large engagement and given the time frames of CSW currently for many of us in this region, so for um, Australia and certainly for the Pacific, the negotiations are taking place overnight. So we're almost on a, a back foot. Um, do you have any suggestions or ways of thinking around expanding this space 
to in the, at the regional level to have a stronger voice coming through at the international and i'll i'll ask you each that question I think I'll uh, start off with uh, responding to the question. Um, <clears throat> I think particularly in my presentation, I talked about the different uh, spaces that Pacific feminist uh, uh, organizations have tried to uh, come together in terms of uh, mobilizing collectively. Um, because one of the things as well, it's not about, uh, you know, it's not only about the issue of uh, shrink the shrinking spaces for civil society, uh, but in terms of uh, regions as well, in terms of the different uh, issues um, that we um, we experience and we face uh, daily. Um, I think in the context of the Pacific, uh, geographically, and uh, you know, and the diversity of the of the region, um, a lot of the countries are still, you know, still in development stages. A lot of the countries are small island states, um, still developing. So a lot of the inf infrastructure tend to be a challenge as well for the Pacific um that we might that does not allow us to sort of uh see a full representation of different organizations from the different sub-regions so uh that particularly is another challenge but in terms of trying to mobilize collectively as a feminist organization and also as women's organizations um we try to uh, be part of different spaces um not only uh you know some of the organization are quite familiar with the process while some of the organizations are still budding through the system yeah. so um for example with fwrm uh i talked about the we rise coalition so the we rise coalition has about three main organization one of the organization is based in australia um that have particularly been highlighting uh, issues and also being part of regional and global processes. Um, but in just a few years ago, um, the coalition had invited another three or four organizations from the Pacific, which were uh, newly um, organized groups. So a lot of um, the groups were just new to the movement um, and as part of their partnership with the coalition the coalition has sort of um, you know taken lead in driving these small groups to uh, formally organize themselves so that you know they particularly be part of uh, these processes. So a lot of the organization that are part of uh, the coalition is still uh, new to the regional spaces, to, uh, to the regional processes and also to the global processes. So um, that is how FWRM has sort of tried to like mobilize uh, women's groups and women's movement um, in the Pacific. Um, so, I think we sort of like are trying to get there. Um, but then again, it's the experience uh, when we get into the actual uh, event like CSW and even um, the high level political forum in terms of, you know, CSO's participation in the space. Again, that's a different uh, experience altogether. But yeah, so that I think from the Pacific region, that is uh, sort of our um, experience. Fantastic, thanks, Lassan. Yeah, the the road the road is about the uh, journey, not the destination, right? <laughs> That's uh, I understand that. Bobby, do you have any comment on the shrinking space and the way that digital formats can help expand or anything? Or yeah, I think I'll build on, on I'll build on what Lassan was saying, which is the you know, like the idea that civil society space is shrinking is one that we kind of put forward ourselves because the traditional avenues that we've had don't exist. Yeah. But I think the thing that we're all sort of very aware of is the elevation of generation equality and the private sector and civil society coming together to solve things that perhaps the environment at CSW is not effective enough at doing. 
Um, it doesn't mean that the CSW doesn't have a space. It might just mean, um, I'm trying to think back and compare the years where we've been able to do it in person in comparison to digitally. And digitally, again, offers accessibility and inclusion that we can't do in person, but it really does cut off those types of experiences of you know, mingling with high, high power delegates who are from other organizations, other countries, um, other spaces, other movements. And it really does cut out that piece of um, spontaneity that is really the best part as a civil society actor in CSW. But when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of it, I think I still come back to my main point, which is that the negotiation process and the influence that you have over your own country and others is in very finite spaces. And cracking into them can take years as an advocacy win. So all of us in our respective countries are probably thinking right now as I'm talking, you know, how would I describe the relationship that I have with people who are going to be negotiating on, on behalf of us? And I really think that when we're looking at impact and when we're thinking about how we can actually make transformative change, a lot of it comes back to those individual relationships that you can build over years um, with people who are hopefully just as obsessed and dedicated with CSW as you are, um, which is great. But I think that we, we need to all be really mindful that digital access and inclusion is great for some ways, it also makes it really difficult as a human rights defender to back away from harmful or vicarious trauma related content, which is bombarding you in these spaces, which many of us, even as larger organizations, find it really difficult to have the digital solutions to keep out. So I think there's, there's really a bit of camaraderie and solidarity in moving forward with CSW. The thematic areas give us a really good point to progress and talk on and build on our actions. But also we shouldn't neglect the fact that we still need to build those relationships with power holders as much as we can in other avenues because yeah, I have to say it's much harder to form a close bond with another human being through a screen. It can be done. Um, but I think a lot of us are really noticing that that part of things does have such an impact in ways that are hard to articulate. So my, I guess my ending comment would be balance and also being mindful that, yeah, we, we, these things do take quite a lot of years to kick in and people peel away and join back in at various points. But I guess that central connection of knowing that it has the power to change how a government will actually do something or make commitments to. Um, just makes it more important for us to diversify whatever those digital or in real life reaction interactions look like. So don't give up. Um, yeah, be mindful that um, it's it's a it's a different space than we than we know and trust right now, and isn't going to change for a, a while. I think. Yeah, thanks, Bobby. I think the, the future of moving forward is going to definitely be a hybrid one where we have some people on the ground building the relationships, which is the context I grew up in and then the uh, came through my power in and um, and definitely remaining and containing, you know, holding on to how we can digitally continue forward. Yeah, Danny, do you have any comments on uh, yeah, yes, to add actually to what uh, Bobby and uh, even you, Ms. Carol, just mentioned. So Sea Watch has really attempted to engage in other ways, you know, acknowledging our limitations as is. We try to you know, do so in other ways, either through training or education or um, even the even our initiative to continuously grow Sea Watch in terms of mem its membership is kind of uh, point towards that, trying to connect where we can and how we can with the people we can connect with to see us. That what was mentioned earlier, I, you know, I we noticed that as we went digital, a lot went on, but we start to forget, you know, the basics. Uh, of digital engagement that we can always go back to like using whatsapp for example that has been honestly for sea watch that has been more effective than using your traditional emails and whatnot so going you know going back to those basics of engagement that um that also uh connecting to what was previously said about you know it's 
it's good, but not everybody is being involved equally. You know, uh, as as we move to doing CSW digitally, a lot of our um, strongest, I'd say, strongest feminists and veterans have kind of dropped out because of that divide. So trying to bridge that gap. And I think this is where having an intergenerational group has been really helpful as well for Sea Watch because where our um, seasoned feminists could not join in uh, for you know, a gap of you know technological gap or whatnot, our, our younger members are able to step in and be that voice for them and actively participate in these spaces, which otherwise would be um, well, you know, uh, would not have us there. So, yeah. and then again, uh, our training with the South Southeast Asian leaders, um, that was an initiative towards education and awareness raising with the right people, not just, you know, raising awareness here and there, but really targeting who we can influence to bring our presence back to CSW and the region and, and bring the region to the international arena again. Fantastic. Thanks, Danny. Were there any more questions or hands up before we close this session? Um, there's a question in the box. Is NGO CSW organizing a parallel event? You know, the uh, NGO CSW will be holding an event on the Saturday prior to CSW um, as part of the NGO CSW forum. And in that, we will be able to advertise those of our members who are being running the different parallel sessions throughout CSW. Um, in the absence of no more questions, please do feel free to post your uh, questions to the contact sheet on the website. I've put the link into the chat box. I would like to personally thank Lasana, Bobby and Danny, um, who I've worked with across, um, you know, the last couple of years with Lasana, Bobby a few more years and Danny even more years than, than that. Um, thank you so much for your time today, your presentations on this panel and your insights have been really enlightening and um, have brought us to new thinking and opened our minds um, uh, with an inquiry of how can we be involved and how can we better be involved and have given us some real options to be able to link into and to um, check out and to see how we can be further involved. So thank you so much for your um, time and um, presentations today. I'll hand us now back to, um, I believe Nalima is taking over. Thank you. Okay, greetings from Nepal to all our participants and panelists. I'm Nilima Basnet from Nepal, and it is a great honor to be among you all who are working really hard to change the status of women globally. Thank you to our MC Gib from Thailand for putting this event on track and opening the poll to understand how much involved and aware our participants are about CSW. And to our NGO CSW, Asia Pacific uh, Vice Chair, Helens from Sweden, uh, New Zealand. Thank you so much for your warm welcome. It really opened up a new uh, you know, perspective about CSW. And thank you to Homaira from Afghanistan for your wonderful presentation about CSW and hope our participants learned what they need to, uh, what and where they need to work in order to keep up, make our voice heard loud and clear and speed up this process of gender equality. Her presentation will be posted on our website, so please check our website. And a big thank you to our NGO CSW co-chair, Carol, from Australia for moderating and clearing the confusion of our participants and pulling this training session so smoothly. And a big thank you to all our panelists today who were so amazing, and I found out that almost all of you are young. And uh, starting with Lozana Tura Viravi, Viravi from Fizi, who is the team leader of Intergenerational Women Leadership Program. Uh, thank you so much for building capacity of young women to you know, critically analyze issues and develop uh, advocacy skills. Your engagement in We Rise Coalition to empower women leading in crisis to come up with you know, equal opportunity and gender responsive budget 
is the need of the moment. And please check out for up upcoming third Pacific Feminist Forum and be part of this uh, forum, whether you are in Pacific or not, because knowledge is very important for all the women. So to follow that, you can go to the website at www.fwrm.org.fj. So please follow this link. And thank you to our speaker from Australia, Bobby Trower, who has worked as a senior manager for advocacy at YWCA Australia. And your contribution towards intersectional feminist uh, understanding has really helped many people to live an inclusive and a dignified life. I agree with you that CSW is not about to, just to attend the event, but to strengthen the relationship with government and power holders and do the networking and sharing, uh, you know, what happens with different parts of the world. Thank you for creating a safe space for young women through YWCA to learn and groom themselves to be a transformational leader. I agree to you that, you know, during this COVID crisis, we can use all the social media to bring young people aware about all the activities about CSW and other women advocacy topics. Thank you so much for everything that you are doing. And finally, to our last speaker, uh, Danny Gonzalez from Philippines, who is also the Southeast Asia Women Watch Secretariat and coordinator for Young Women Leadership Program. Thank you so much for explaining about, you know, uh, about how Sea Watch is working for commitment to the Beijing Platform for Action. And thank you for giving your participation a high, you know, youth participation a high priority during your event and starting intergenerational dialogue for a more effective outcome. Your hard work will definitely, definitely empower many young women to run for the board and reform policies at different level. Thank you for highlighting that import uh, implementation process uh, of CSW and opening the floor to government to showcase what they are doing between the government and civil society is, I think, what all the countries should be doing. And, uh, you know, thank you for also have, telling us about, you know, the importance of sh shadow report and how we need to get involved with it and also bringing, you know, how to bring more women in CSW. Uh, and thank you so much to all our three panelists and for Adele Khan who could not join, she was tested COVID positive and she told me that she would attend if everything was normal. I hope something had must have happened. So, and finally to our technical support person, Dilna Wasik, who is the only male person in this floor today. I think he's more feminist than me as he has been working with uh, political literacy for women in Nepal and training young women to run for government because we need more women like him to create a gender equality in this world. Thank you so much to our uh, you know, vice chair, uh, Subek Charana and committee member, Sami Singh for all your contribution. And with this, I would like to thank you all for your patience and I request you all to follow the Facebook page of NGO CSW, it's the Pacific, and the website is www.apngocsw.org. And any question unanswered today will be put on the website. So feel free to post any questions you may have. Um, there is another event that we are planning for March. So please follow the social media and also about NGO CSW in New York. Uh, they are having many webinars and trainings, so please follow the social media and keep yourself updated for that. And one of the major events at CSW is the Youth Forum that's happening. And there is a youth preparation series for NGO CSW every Wednesday leading up to NGO CSW 66. So please attend those events if you are new and young. And for more information, follow the uh, Instagram, Facebook, everything that we have. So personally, you know, after hearing all of you, the speakers here today, after I have I have served for BPW International as a young representative for three years. And during my term, what I realized is that we have many young women around the world with the potential to be a great leader, but all they are lacking is the opportunity due to many reasons and hope we all, you know, we will see many young leaders in the world in next the decade, I guess. So hopefully, you know, we'll be able to achieve gender equality by 2030, not just gender wise, but in the, uh, you know, intergenerational wise as well. And with that, I hope you all had an informative and inspiring event today. We look forward to meeting you at the next event. Till then, take care and stay safe. Thank you so much. <laughs>